notice that the uh, tendon is um, inflamed or painful during a run or shortly after. Usually you'll notice that it's red, it's hot, it's swollen. Um, there is definitely clear swelling. And then the key difference really is what it looks like under a microscope when the tissues are stained. Uh, what you'll see in tendonitis is that the um, tendon fibers or collagen, which is type one collagen, is organized in straight lines and basically looks like a normal tendon, albeit with maybe some small tears within the tendon. And inflammatory cells will be present in that um, section. So this tends to respond well to rest, ice, anti-inflammatories, activity modification, heel lifts, um, and is typically shorter lived than the tendinosis problem. And the way I think of it as this is still tendon that's relatively normal and capable of a normal healing response. I don't usually see these patients in my clinic because usually people don't come to the doctor the second something hurts, but occasionally I will, and that kind of helps with education. And then the flip side, and what we're talking about more here today is tendinosis. And this is more of a chronic or recurrent problem in the tendon um, that instead of being red, hot, swollen, or boggy, it'll just be thickened. It'll be a chronically thickened tendon that's still painful in the same areas. And when you look at it under a microscope, you won't see inflammatory cells. What you'll see instead is you'll see very disorganized collagen fibers, different types of collagen. You'll see new blood vessel formation, um, uh, as well as new nerve ending formation, which may be the explanation for why these tend to hurt so much. Um, I think anti-inflammatories can still be good for pain. They're certainly not gonna alter the healing environment, uh, and that's because there aren't inflammatory cells there. It's more difficult to eliminate symptoms, but the good news is this is very responsive to physical therapy. Um, and the way I think about this is sort of a degenerative problem where the environment is no longer normal for healing. So why does that matter? Well, one, it tells you that if you have new onset of Achilles pain when you're running, there should be some bell that goes off in your head that you need to kind of back off a little bit and give this some time to recover so that you don't flip into this more abnormal environment for healing. Um, and also it just kind of changes how we approach uh, these things. So we know what it is, what causes it. I think it's a little bit poorly understood, but we know some things that are common in patients uh, that we see. Um, as people get older, male age, runners, people who have systemic illness, I usually think of diabetes or chronic kidney disease, rheumatoid arthritis, things that lead to a poor healing environment on their own. Um, there's been some association with lower extremity malalignment. I think what I typically see and think of is patients with flat foot shape. But again, that's probably because patients with flat foot shape or overpronation, as many people will call it, um, tend to have tighter heels. And we could talk about the anatomy of that, but or they have tighter Achilles and tighter gastrocnemius muscles. And that's probably really what the association is rather than just the shape of their foot. Um, and then extrinsic factors. So things like training errors, not cross training, overuse, so running hills when you haven't done it in a while, changing your shoes, um, if you're on certain medications like antibiotics or steroids, all of these things we see are common factors with patients that come in with these symptoms of Achilles tendinosis. Um, although we don't know exactly why some people who have these things don't have it and some people do. And again, I think the take home is this is once the tendon becomes tendon, uh, once it becomes tendinosis or tendinopathy, this is now an abnormal tendon. Um, and you are no longer favoring healing in this environment. You're in a degenerative phase. Yeah, I guess, I guess the quick question here, Adam, too, is um, since there's a lot of PTs watching, what do you think is the best window of time to send someone to you when? Is it, you know, what maybe what the timeline looks like for not responding to PT? Is it, you know, eight weeks, 12 weeks? Is it just a fresh, I mean, the tendinosis can be super frustrating for sure. 
as yeah. a pathology. But when, when do you like therapists to kind of get you involved early? So because so many of them are we're doing the referring these days. Yeah. Well, I think you hit on one of the important points is it probably depends on multiple factors. Um, but one of those is how frustrated is the patient? Do they do they need, you know, another set of eyes on this to just kind of confirm what you guys are seeing? I'm always happy to see people early and talk to them. Um, and certainly, you know, kind of be an extra set of eyes and maybe offer a couple of other treatments that maybe some things just kind of get lost in translation and be another um, advocate for the patient to get uh, the different treatments that they could get. Um, but I think maybe one way to answer that question is, is I'm, I'm not going to be doing an operation or an injection until this really isn't getting better for at least eight to 12 weeks, probably. I think, I think reality is it's probably more like six months for um, non-insertional Achilles tendinosis, which we'll kind of talk about the difference of those two presentations in a second. But I really think that usually gets better without surgery, and it sometimes just needs a little bit of time and TLC. But I'm always happy to see people, but I think give it, you know, six to 12 weeks of therapy probably before you um, try that. That's good. That's good. Words of wisdom there. That helps. Yeah. Is that kind of what you're experiencing, Ben, or what you have suggested? Yeah, I know. For you? Yeah. I think if there's been a good uh, evaluation and workup by the therapist on their end, I think if you're kind of in the, in the patient's um, compliant and listening and, and made the necessary changes, whether it be, you know, footwear, uh, forces, home exercise programs, sleep, um, yeah. as, you, as you can appreciate, a lot of Achilles tendinopathies from new parents. Mm -hmm. still like to run with a stroller is um if, if everything is kind of if they're following all the right things then i, th I think that and the therapist has done a great job i think it's that's typically what i usually like to do is 10 to 12 weeks and, and get a get a physician involved if they're not one already um i've got a quick question here too that i think is pretty um timely um this is from madison you mentioned six months for non-insertional tendinosis what is the time for insertional what, what's the timeline you like there it's a good question, and I think it probably depends on what the patient has, you know, done and tried. And I think, like what you touched on, is are they actually doing the right things, right? So, uh, but it's it's shorter for me because I think that usually the insertional tendinopathy tends to be more often associated with large bone spurs or mechanical changes to the tendon that don't seem, in my experience, to respond quite as well to physical therapy, although I'd always suggest it. I, probably three months, I guess, is the short answer to that, is I, I want them to try appropriate conservative care for three months before jumped into a surgical treatment. Yeah. And if they're getting better, I might say, why don't you wait it out a little bit and see what happens? And I think that's that's the dicey part for the PT is when you start to see that progress, then it's how quickly do you let them resume mm -hmm. Peloton and the cleat running full speed track workouts, trail running, all, all kinds of different types of trail running, trail running on roots or trail running on gravel, you know, it's kind of a or hills or yeah, yeah, we got the beautiful corridor there, which is great for Achilles tendinopathy, but then we have also, you know, the Crestwood stairs, which are about as extreme as you get for getting on the Achilles. So yeah. Um, all in the in the neighborhood here so yeah. i'll let you kind of get back on track but thanks for the question yeah of course okay so um we kind of touched on we're kind of jumping into to discussing this a little bit but there's two basic main um presentations of achilles tendinosis um there's insertional and there's mid-substance or non-insertional i think most of the people on this chat, although maybe that question suggests i'm wrong uh most of the people on this chat are probably runners who have um, a non, or non insertional or mid substance Achilles uh, tendinopathy. This is a great clinical picture um, that comes from uh, one of the foot and ankle surgery textbooks that I have in my, um, uh, actually sitting right behind me here, um, where on the, in the picture labeled A, you see a very clearly thickened Achilles tendon. And hopefully you can, you guys can see my arrow here compared to a much more normal, at least for this patient, Achilles tendon in shape. Um, and this is a very typical, you can see it's occurring in that vascular watershed zone. That area is usually quite tender, um, more common in young, healthy patients, although that's not always true. Um, again, similar to 
like we said, we don't know exactly why this happens, but we think it's repetitive microtrauma combined with the tight Achilles along with some of these other factors that we talked about. Um, as you can see, even by the clinical photo here, this patient is obviously older than the patient that we saw in the other view. And this is sort of a classic picture of a fairly advanced case of insertional Achilles tendinopathy. You're seeing on the back of this heel something that we call a pump bump, which uh, refers to this uh, calcification of the insertion of the Achilles tendon, which actually comes down here and inserts broadly on the calcaneus. The red arrow is pointing at what's called a Haglund's deformity, which you may have heard of if you have this uh, uh, symptom or this uh, diagnosis, excuse me. Um, the Haglund's deformity here is actually not a very big Haglund's deformity, but you can imagine if the tendon runs down right over that and there's a large bump here, the tendon and the bursa associated with that um, tendon can rub and become, and become inflamed or have micro tears in that area. On the MRI on the right here, this is a T2-weighted image, which means fluid looks white. Um, you can see a little bit of that where they're right at the insertion where my arrow is. You can see a little bit of an inflamed bursa, certainly not a dramatic one, um, and, and quite a thickened tendon. Yeah, those can be pretty frustrating because that, well, on a lot of shoes, and this is where maybe, maybe shoe selection can be important too, is having that space in the heel cup to really allow for that to clear. Yeah, um, there is a there is a. What do you what do you usually recommend for that question? See somebody come in who's who's actually complaining of the sh like you know it's not just a mechanical thing it's actually the rubbing of the shoe. What do you usually tell people for that? Yeah, try, trying to look for something that's going to allow them to have some um, kind of adherence up above it. So there's the uh, New Balance has a fresh foam 1080 which has a nice cupping there that works pretty well. The new Nimbus uh, 25 um, from Asics is has a little bit of space there too. You and I were talking a little bit ahead of time, the Brooks Ghost and yeah, Ghost and Max has a little bit of space there. I think if you have a gripping up above, it takes the pistoning out a little bit. There is a, there is a material that, that I'll occasionally use that is made by 3M called PFTE, which is kind of a frictionless um, adhesive plastic you can put inside the, if you, so if you have a nice running sock, like a Belega sock or something of that nature, the, the coefficient of friction, your mu will be decreased. So the, the irritation there will be a little bit less um, but many times that pistoning, what I see is it, it comes from the tail curl joint. So a little stiffness on the front of the joint creates a little bit more rigidity and, and movement in the heel. So um, that's something to kind of address with some, some stretching or mobilization. So, um, but that, that's not, won't take away the, the Haglund's deformity. That, that's oh, it's no. kind of with you. So it's just, can you accommodate it? Um, you know, and some people do well with like a leather, like a, you know, like a leather shoe when they're just in a casual shoe. So that can be kind of a helpful thing too. Yeah. And Ben, actually, that brings up a point, you know, you can't get rid of that um, bony bump without surgery, but we, we should at least mention that I see a lot of patients with x-rays like this who do not have symptoms. And a lot of patients whose ankles look like this guy's ankle here and does not have symptoms. So just because you develop symptoms doesn't mean you have to have surgery to take that off. Um, it just increases your chances that you're heading, heading that way, I think. Um, I put my slides in a little bit of reverse order, but I, but I think, you know, prevention is important for this uh, problem. I think uh, a, a response, this is taken from the Mayo Clinic website. I mean, it's, it's basic. I think, you know, anybody who's gone through this um, symptomatology before has probably looked this up and done stuff like this, but it's a common sense approach of increasing your activity level gradually avoiding really strenuous things to start. So running on hills, running downhill, doing too much work, not doing any cross training. Um, stretching is a little controversial uh, for, for this uh, issue, um, but I think in general, it's probably wise to do some gentle stretching before uh, you run, just to kind of get that gastric soleus complex a little bit stretched out to take a little bit of pressure off um, of the Achilles tendon as you run. And certainly strengthening, which is a mainstay of recovery from this uh, is important as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of controversy and debate on stretching, right? I, yeah. My take typically with patients is I ask them, do you like stretching? And if they say I like stretching, then I'm like, then enjoy the stretching. Cause it's, yeah. it's, if it's psychologically and creates some blood flow and makes you feel ready to take on 
whatever activity is, whether it be strength training or an actual aerobic activity, then, then, then let's do it. It's kind of similar, like I have the similar um, thoughts and on foam rolling and, and, you know, movement prep. And Hey, if you, if it makes you ready for the event, if you feel ready, more ready, then let's do it. <laughs> if you, if you hate it, then we'll, we'll find other things we can spend that time on. Yeah, I think that's great. I think, I think for foam rolling for me, if they're, if they're in a lot of pain, I tell them don't foam roll on the Achilles itself, at least in that early phase, I would do it in the muscle, the gas rock, if you really want to do that. Um, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm with you on that. It's, it's, it's controversial. And that's another thing that we should say is when you're, when I say to stretch to patients um, in the acute kind of recovery phase of this, I'm telling them you're gently stretching. You're not really pushing this. You're just trying to get the thing moving more than anything else. Right. Um, and sorry. So uh, I do think that we should touch on when you first have a bad flare up of tendinosis or tendinitis, I think the first line of treatment for me is a period of rest. And I think rest can mean a lot of different things depending on your activity level and your level of pain. And I think the kind of top tier or most aggressive rest would be putting you into a rocker bottom boot with a heel lift. And I'll do that for some patients who are really, really flared up and having a lot of pain. And that could be anywhere from one to four weeks, but that's not kind of the end all be all for that treatment. You got to get moving and get to your eccentric strengthening exercises. So one of the ways to get out of that is you just avoid high impact activity or painful activity do cross training and you can wear a shoe with a little lift in it or add a heel lift to one of your shoes. And then NSAIDs, ice, gentle motion are all okay things to be doing and make you feel better. Don't think they help you heal, but they make you feel better. Um, and then if you're watching this talk and you're gonna take anything home uh, with you, I think the most important thing for both prevention and treatment of Achilles tendinosis is eccentric strengthening. Um, and what I mean by eccentric strengthening is that you need the muscular tendinous unit to be lengthening while it's contracting. So it's slow on the way down is the way that you describe that exercise. Um, and when people are in a lot of pain, I start really simple. I'll start with going up on your heels with both of your feet on flat ground and very slowly lowering down. For a more active uh, patient, that's going to feel really boring and not like it's very challenging. So you got to scale that up. And I think that's usually when I'm suggesting that you go see a professional, like a physical therapist to kind of walk you through and how to advance that activity. And the takeaway is it works. It has very few um, complications. And when you look at randomized controlled trials, which are basically the best studies we can do, is almost all of them show significant improvements and none of them show complications. So you should be doing this. You should be looking up how to do this. Uh, it should be the mainstay of your treatment. And to be honest, as someone in their late 40s, it's kind of a mainstay prevention for me. Um, just if you're going to play pickup basketball with your kids or go for a trail run or play pickleball, like we were talking about earlier, this yeah. is something I think you want your Achilles kind of ready. The research is pretty conflicted on the sets and reps. That's pretty debatable. And there's been, you know, some show five reps, some say 20 reps, some say, you know, weighted in both hands, some weighted in the opposite hand, some on the same, same sided hand. So there's a lot of arguments there, but I think the takeaway um, that you and I talked about offline was just that, you know, we're looking at for our runners out there, you're talking about a, when you're in single leg stance, you're looking at about six times your body weight on the force, depending on the speed, turn from three to six times your body weight. Um, so to be able to control this with just your body weight is, um, you know, something you need to be able to do. So really, ultimately, it's it's getting to a point where you can load it uh, when you return to some healthy levels is being able to load it to a level that challenges um, not just your proprioception, but really fatigues the muscle. So um, some people use it more as a proprioceptive exercise. So they're using, their hands aren't on anything, which I think has some benefits. But I think if you really want to take the muscle and the tendon and take it to a level where it's going to be when you're running, especially running the incline, um, if you're doing Boston or something like that, where we're going to have some hills, then you're going to want to have that to the point where you're doing, you know, you know, two, two times body weight kind of thing, like it's at least... So, yeah. so that takes a little while to build up to it, to your point, like kind of, you can go 3% rule, 5% rule of how quickly you increase that when your symptoms are down. But it's something I think you want to entertain to remain running injury free 
and 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 said you know having prs and um yeah. you know like we talked about earlier too like the master runners they have an incidence of about eight to thirty percent um achilles just kind of one of the top top yeah. injuries it's um, pretty crazy so, yeah so fun stuff Feel yeah, free to, it's feel high level. I mean, it, I, I hate to spring this question on you because we hadn't talked about it before, but you know, what, what's your take on using blood flow restriction in that context of really trying to get your load up and um, without yeah. injuring yourself? Right, right. So yeah. uh, people that know what blood flow restriction is, it's there's uh, cuffs that basically measure your blood pressure um, in the lower extremity or upper extremity, depending on which, which joint or which muscle you want to attack. And it basically creates some occlusion. So it creates some difficulty of doing the exercise. I actually like this. And as soon as people are kind of cleared for um, any kind of vascular issues or any kind of, uh, especially post-surgical with Achilles, when we can't really do a lot of strength training with weight yet, but you can yeah. still fatigue it like crazy. And there's a couple of good studies that just came out that were talking about max exertion versus max fatigue. Um, that are brand new, like 2023 articles and showing that they're actually pretty equitable as far as um, you know, kind of one and three rep max versus 25 rep fatigue max and kind of creating the same muscle, muscle strength. Um, so the blood flow restriction can really do a great job on that. Um, that was a really, really popular thing in PT about three years ago. And I th still think it has, um, it's just because it was, I don't want to call it a fad, but it was kind of like, one of those, it was a new thing. Um, I think the, the things that made it popular early on are still super relevant. And I haven't seen any research that's proven otherwise. It's, it can be a really useful tool. Um, let me, I have one question here that was sent in too. Let me grab this one from you too, because I think it kind of is towards the end of this one, but it says, um, from Mina, can, can tendonitis convert to tendinopathy or vice versa in an Achilles tendon? Yeah, I, I think tendonitis probably does convert to tendinopathy. I think that's probably the natural history of disease. Um, I'm actually not aware that I have actually read a study stating that, but that's always been my understanding of the process. And it's always made sense to me where you have a normal tendon structure, you have micro tears or micro trauma to the tendon, and then you get abnormal collagen growth. And then that becomes tendinopathy. I think going the opposite way, going from tendinopathy to a normal tendon, I don't think that that happens. I think we do something with this eccentric strengthening or with some of these other modalities that changes the healing environment and the blood flow environment and the nerve environment enough to make things improve. But I don't think that if you section the tendon, because I think this di the, the definition of these two is based on you know uh, microscopic examination of the tendon, I don't think your tendon is going to go back to normal. And I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I don't think I've ever seen a truly fusiform thickened you know, here I'll show you guys a picture. Um, tendinopathic tendon truly gets smaller. I mean, there might be a little bit of inflammation loss, but I don't think that tendon gets smaller with non-operative care. Yeah, I've never, I've never seen it shrink back down. I think that's the goal. A lot of people think it's going to shrink back down. I think to your point, I think it's many times a nervous tissue issue where it's the eccentric loading is working. We don't. I think we always don't know why. Is it blood flow? Is it tissue? You know, tissue tolerance. Like people get just more tolerant and the nociceptive or kind of painful input at the spinal cord level or at the brain is not, it's not determined to be a threat anymore to the tissue. Yeah. And so people yeah. do well with they're like, okay, it's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, I don't, I think it's, um, yeah, I haven't seen one. I haven't seen a slim down. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen, I haven't seen that either. Right. But they, that they get better all the time. So I think that's kind of you, if you're struggling with that problem, you don't, your goal is not to get it skinny. Um, your goal is not to shrink the size of that tendon. Your goal is to be pain-free and strong so that you can get back to running. Yeah, and, I, and I've also seen it. it can, they can look as asymmetrical as the one you showed, and they could actually still have the same vertical leap off both yeah. sides. So yeah. it's kind of, you can return back to, to normal. It just takes a little while. Yeah, and, and I mean, that logically makes sense. You know, you've got a thick tendon, but you haven't changed anything about the muscular structure uh, that's responsible for the force. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we, we briefly touched on this before, Ben, just mechanical modalities. So, you know, um, things like Graston technique or uh, manual stimulation or manipulation of the tendon itself or things around that area, do you think that that has a role in Achilles tendinosis? 
You know, I think it, it, it for those stubborn cases where people are can't seem to get traction in a rehab, you know, where it just feels like every visit, it feels like, oh, it's about the same, it's about the same, it's about the same. I think that's something you can kind of play around with. I think it kind of follows a little bit in line with what we were talking about with stretching. And if you think Graston or ultrasound or um, acupuncture or dry needling, whatever, any, of those, any of those techniques you feel is really making a difference and allows you to get to the eccentrics and your walking program and, and doing some squatting and that sort of thing. I think if it lets you get to the point where you can load the tendon, then I'm all for it. So I think to me, the holy grail is, can we get you back to what you want to do? And then two, can you eccentrically load that tendon um, to create a tolerance and some strength in that gastroc soleus complex. Yeah. And, the, and the soleus is, is so underappreciated. I know a lot of PTs on the call, like there's, there's so much Instagram of PT doing hip strengthening and, 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 and squats and, and lunges and that sort of thing. But if you sleep on the soleus, that's going to be responsible for about you know, arguably 40 to 60% of all your running stride and a good chunk of your walking stride too. So I think that's, um, you know, whether you start seated and work up or however you do it, but you, you know, there's lots of different techniques to address the soleus, but I think that's something you need to, to kind of don't sleep on the soleus. I like don't it. Sleep on it. Only for, on only for cats, cats and dogs are the only ones that can sleep on the soleus. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I had a quick question here. Um, um, what, are, what are your thoughts? On, it looks like we're going to get to it too. I think in a few, a slide or two, but what are your thoughts on shock wave therapy? Cause it kind of fits in the same because I, because, because I've had it done to myself. Um, I've, we've done it with other therapists and I've seen quite a few patients on this as well. Um, I anecdotally have seen uh, really good results. Again, I don't know if it's, if it's just a rededication to the, the home exercise program or if it's placebo or what it may be, but it, I've seen probably a 75% um, improvement rate with that, but yeah. it's usually tied with therapy and doing, and again, maybe it gets us to the eccentrics. Maybe that's part of it. Well, uh, when I was in Boston, um, we had a, a program in our um, facility where they did shockwave therapy, where basically we would say, yeah, this is an a option that you can try. It's very low risk. Um, as you see on my slide here, it's typically a cash pay um, type thing, which is one of the negatives of it. Usually insurance won't cover it, um, although that may change as more data comes out. Um, and anecdotally same thing. I thought these patients seem to be doing much better. Um, now, the natural history of, his, of Achilles tendinosis um, that, is, that has eccentric strengthening is to get better um, most of the time. Um, but I think it's been shown to um, improve things like tennis elbow, plantar fasciitis, uh, Achilles tendinosis. Um, and I think it's promising. I, I, don't, I don't know that I have seen, you know, slam bang convincing evidence. And I know that our um, society says the jury's still out. It's not like strongly recommended, um, but I think it's a very reasonable thing to do. And certainly I've actually asked our um, uh, staff to get us one of those machines because I don't have a great place to refer it to, but maybe you do this. And I just didn't know that, Ben. Is this something that you no. guys do? No, I don't. We, we have a couple of locations that we use for this, but I think it's great if you had it. I think it's it's one of those things too, if you're, if you're looking at doing a tenotomy or something more aggressive, this is a great first step. Um, and I think, you know, it just, it prevents possibly unnecessary procedures later on. Um, yeah. But again, it is cash pay. So it's, you know, it can be, um, yeah, I think it's, and I've seen typically three 20 minute sessions is pretty much what I've seen as a, yeah. uh, and yeah, the, there is a couple, there are a couple of papers out there. I'm with you. I'm in agreement with you. I don't think there's a, 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 a end all be all uh, research paper that I've seen, but there are a couple that are somewhat compelling, like in sizes of 20 to 40 um, participants where they're doing, um, you know, eccentrics alone, shockwave alone and eccentrics yeah. with shockwave. And the, the, the third group is the one that definitely outperforms the, um, the control. So. Agreed. I, that's that's what I think is promising. I know I've read that study, um, and I and I, I think that that is kind of why I was recommending it much more often when I had it easily available to me. Um, but I think really kind of you touched on you know a, the idea behind a tenotomy. So you know we we were going to talk about uh, well actually that's a good slide too. So sorry, you know, sorry, I'm hitting shuffle on your slide. No, no, that's <laughs> totally that's totally fine. But I mean this is exactly right. I mean what we're 
what we have acknowledged at the very beginning of this presentation is that tendinosis means you have an abnormal healing environment in the tendon and you're having a hard time um, getting that to become a normal tendon. Um, almost all the treatments that we talk about um, are probably working by altering that environment in some way to either uh, encourage um, uh, the collagen to reorganize itself a little bit or to change the nerve um, feedback to your brain a little bit. So whether it's eccentric strengthening, uh, percutaneous tenotomy like we're seeing here, whether it's a saline breeze mod where you're really just trying to break up things around the Achilles tendon. I think all of these are just, we're trying to change something about the environment because we know that you can have this thickened tendon and be fine and jump high. We just need it to stop hurting you. That's what we need. Right. So I, I, think, yeah. and I, and I, I like to kind of biohack myself. So I've done PRP, I've done shockwave. Um, obviously I've done eccentrics too. So I, these are all like, I think great options. And, and again, PRP for people that aren't familiar with that is we have, we have webinars on that as well that we've done with other physicians, but um, it's, again, it's a low risk procedure, but it is unfortunately cash pay as well. Um, insurance companies probably want to keep it that way. Yeah. <laughs> There's no grand conspiracy, I don't think, but I think they, you know, if people are willing to pay for it out of pocket, then they're, they're happy to have that happen. Yeah. And uh, I think that that's typically what I say is, you know, I think that there's almost no risk to it. Um, I think uh, it's, it's relatively, or maybe I should say very low risk to it. Um, and some people have had fantastic results from it. I think the thing that I always say as a caveat, and this is the reason why the insurance companies are probably going to be successful in kind of punting this down the road into a cash pay payment, is because the Journal of the American Medical Association did come out with this paper um, with a reasonable amount of participants for an orthopedic study, um, or orthopedic type study, which is 240 patients, um, where they did platelet-rich plasma versus a sham injection on the tendon, and they didn't show a significant difference between these tendons. Now, now, that could be for a variety of reasons, including they didn't inject it in the right place. They used the wrong concentration of PRP or the wrong spin down technique. They chose the wrong patients, but this exists out there. So I think when I tell patients about this, I always have to tell them this study exists so they don't think I'm being a charlatan. Um, but, but, I, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I do think it's, it's a very reasonable thing to try, especially if you know you have the 800 to 1200 bucks, whatever it is that it's going to end up costing you. Yeah, and you know what, what might influence the study too is if the participants were paying for it. Yeah. I think, I think what I've seen, including myself probably, is like when you pay for it, you want it to work and you do your rehab that much better because because you've, you've got even more skin in the game. So yeah, I think there's probably some truth to that. Not, not, not every patient we see has, has that, has that um, luxury of, of challenging themselves like that, but it's yeah. a pretty good thing. Yeah. Um, let's see, did I skip anything? Uh, hopefully I answered that shockwave therapy question. I, I think it changes the healing environment. I think it's promising, you know, no objections to that. Um, we talked about injections. I, I would make a plug. Don't, I personally do not think you should let someone inject steroids by your Achilles tendon. Um, I have seen at least three ruptures from that, uh, in the last, for four or five years or so. Granted, you know, these people were having an Achilles tendon problem in the first place, so maybe it wasn't the steroid, but I also don't see steroid ruptures very commonly with Achilles tendinosis. Um, uh, and I have seen it several times with steroid injections. So I, I don't do it. Our society recommends against it. Um, so I don't think steroid injections by the tendon are a great idea. No, I, I would second that. I think you'll see that on uh, Sundays in the NFL. There's usually a couple a year where they're getting injected to be able to play on the weekend. And, you know, if you have a mid-substance, it many times will go. Um, it's a long recovery if you get that. It's, yeah. it's a lot longer than working through a non-insertional tendinopathy problem. You'll, sure. you'll get to know your PT really well. Yes, you um, uh, let's see. There's a question real quick. Someone said, will we be discussing ultrasound treatments? I'm assuming that they're talking about shockwave, but... Um, if not, I, you know, if we're talking just about, um, there, you know, of course there's diagnostic ultrasound. We have a whole webinar on that, that Dr. Hyman did. Um, that's a good way to kind of take a look at the substance of the Achilles, um, whether it be insertional or mid-substance. Um, but as far as using ultrasound to heat it up as a, as a modality in like a physical therapy setting, 
Um, not a lot of research on that. I would say it's similar to Graston or ASTEM as far as the um, efficacy of the ultrasound. I'm not necessarily against it. So if someone feels that, like we talked about earlier, it feels like it gets the Achilles ready to do the exercise program within the clinic or it helps them get back to walking a little more comfortably, then great. Um, but it's, it's not something I think is as commonly used as it was in the 80s and 90s um, in a clinic. Agree, although I'm not an expert on it. I think the only other thing you could use ultrasound for is some, you know, directed injections or dry needling so that you can actually see what you're doing on the tendon. It's not, a, it's not something that I have skill with, but we have some providers in our clinic who do have that skill. I don't refer for that very often. Um, so I guess, you know, the summary of this is what works for tendinopathy. So non-insertional tendinopathy, you got a really good chance of getting better without surgery. Um, I think shockwave, bereavement, physical therapy, uh, eccentric strengthening are the keys, emphasis on eccentric strengthening. Um, uh, you can take NSAIDs and, um, for pain control. Early on, you probably want to do a little bit of rest and activity modification and slowly ramp up. Um, uh, insertional, I think they're less likely to do well. 50 to 60% is me guessing. That is not something that I looked up before this um, uh, talk. Um, I just get the sense that insertional tendinopathy with large bone spurs do less well uh, with non-surgical care. And that doesn't mean you can put it, you can't put it off for a long time. You often can, but you'll just have this cyclical symptom, uh, symptomatology where it'll get better, you're doing a good job, and then it'll flare up for whatever reason, you know, um, and then generally that course is getting worse or the bump is getting bigger, but it's not true for everybody. Like I said, I've seen plenty of people who have big spurs back there who aren't bothered by them at all. Um, surgical treatment. Well, we talked about this a little bit. Um, I don't really use this in my practice. I think, you know, the, the, the paper talking about this says it's great for minimal disease or with poor operative candidates. And that sounds like minimal disease is a poor operative candidate. Um, so to me, I, 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 I don't know. I, I think if you were desperate and you failed a really long time with therapy and the MRI was pretty normal, maybe this would be something um, I would consider, but I'm not excited about it. Um, I think other things that you can talk about is you can mechanically lengthen the gastrocnemius complex by performing what's called a strayer procedure. Um, that's when you actually cut across the gastrocnemius tendon in some of the soleus fascia. And then you basically just let the muscle pull up and that essentially lengthens the unit um, and have been shown in a few different studies to uh, reduce uh, pain. Um, the question that I always get with that is, well, aren't I going to be weaker after you do that? Because you do lengthen the tendon um, unit. I think the answer is probably yes, but probably not something somebody who's not an elite athlete or a, you know, elite long distance runner is going to notice significantly or can't rehab from. Um, and then, of course, there are some arthroscopic treatments where you can just shave the tendon, but I don't love those because you can't get a really good sense of the disease tendon portion. And like I said, you want to be viewing surgery for real disease that has failed real non-operative care, I think. Um, hopefully nobody's uh, disturbed or bothered by these pictures, but these are some surgical pictures of an uh, open tendon debridement for non-insertional Achilles tendonitis, uh, like, or tendinosis, excuse me. Um, uh, you should fail six months of non-op care, I think. You got to get an MRI proving that there's a lot of disease that's important for surgical planning. Typically what's done is you open up the tendon and you can actually see some very abnormal looking tissue here. It comes out better in real life, trust me. And what surgeons and textbooks describe it as is it looks like crab meat. It's a very um, uh, shiny, uh, smooth material that doesn't look like tendon fibers that are really thin. And you can see that the surgeon here is taking and folding over the more normal looking tendon on top of the tendon. And this has been shown to have very good results with return to activity. Um, recovery is a bit longer. Um, you're not, not running for four months, probably, uh, realistically four months. You'd probably be allowed at three months, but I don't think many people are doing that. Um, another uh, adjunct, so for example, if you come in here and crab meat is more than 50% of the tendon and you're worried about um, getting a rupture, then typically what's recommended is a flexor hallucis longus tendon transfer, which means you take the long flexor to the big toe. So it just does this to your big toe, bends it down. Hopefully you guys can see that in the picture. 
and you actually cut that from the, a spot at the inner ankle and you plug it into the heel. And what that does is it adds power um, to the back of the heel and plantar flexion strength. It also brings a good blood supply to the Achilles tendon, which we've said repeatedly does not have a good blood supply. You can see this really nice um, red muscle belly here with good blood supply that we can bring up to the tendon. Um, that's an interesting procedure. A lot of people ask, hey, am I gonna have, am I gonna notice this big toe weakness? Um, very interestingly, they did a study on pro soccer players in Europe where they took 20 guys who had acute ruptures of their Achilles tendon. They transferred this tendon in addition to doing a minimally invasive repair of the Achilles, and those patients got back to play very quickly, and they actually played professional sports without this big toe flexor tendon. So if they can do it, you can probably get by without it. Um, so if you have to have that done, it's not the end of the world. It's actually a pretty good surgery. It's a little hairy, though, because you can see this knife is actually lying on top of the neurovascular bundle, which is the nerve and blood vessel right here. So just something to be done with caution, but it, it does work quite well. Um, treatments for insertional. So uh, one, minimally, one minimally invasive approach is the Zadek osteotomy, where you cut the bone. Um, if you're kind of seeing this picture, what's basically happening is they're cutting a wedge out of bone like this and allowing them to rotate the back of the heel up. And what that does is it functionally, well, it, it takes tension off the Achilles tendon, um, which theoretically functionally shortens the unit. But I think the key is that it's just taking load off the Achilles tendon itself. You can see that they did not address these bone spurs or calcifications within the tendon. Um, I... Uh, probably would do this for somebody who is a more poor operative candidate that could tolerate some non-weight bearing time. Um, not something that I do usually in practice. This is usually what I do. Um, we, it's an Achilles takedown with removal of the spurs. This is actually an actual patient of mine where you see a large bone spur calcium within the Achilles tendon, a small Haglund's deformity. We just smooth all that out and then reattach the Achilles tendon after getting rid of that crab meat appearance. Um, very good results at two years. Um, it does take a little bit of time to recover from. I mean, I think I've seen patients back to running at four months, but I'd say six months is more typical um, for this. And that's kind of my go-to surgery. Um, that's kind of it. That's what I wanted to talk about. So I think, you know, if we got more questions, I'd be happy to answer them and go over things. Yeah, we got, we got, we got quite a few. So I appreciate everyone's participation here. Um, so Karen, with the first question, have you heard anything about specific walking shoes, specifically Hoka's? They might cause Achilles tendonitis issues, question mark. That was suggested on my PT because the rigid rocking base was not allowing the tendon to stretch out properly with each step. Well, I guess it depends on the patient. I didn't get to see this uh, patient walk, obviously, or get a good sense of that. So I wouldn't want to say or nay say another clinician when they're um, watching you walk. I think typically I think of a shoe that has a higher heel or a little bit, not a zero drop shoe, not a really flat shoe as a better thing to use when you're having Achilles tendon problems because it helps the Achilles basically. Same kind of idea with a rocker bottom. I mean, we put people in these rocker bottom boots and they seem to do pretty well. So you know, I don't know. I guess it depends on you, but my my take would be that that uh, like a rocker bottom. You know, whether you choose a Hoka or another another brand, uh, a rocker bottom type shoe, in my head, should be most of the time a good idea rather than a bad idea. Yeah, we. I was actually in the. We were talking a little bit before. I was in the Brooks lab about three months ago, and we were looking at. They did a really huge study of hundreds and hundreds of walkers and runners, and they were looking at every shoe on the market. So you know, if we're looking at the Hoka Bondi or we're looking at the Hoka Clifton, those are the two most commonly used ones. You're looking at an offset between six and eight millimeters from heel to toe with a stack height of around 39 millimeters. So pretty, pretty sizable stack height. So I think, what it, you know, the, the rock, I would agree completely. Like the rocker bottom is going to help with your push off. It's going to be probably decrease EMG activity a little bit at the gastroc. Um, and what could be causing some issue is depending on the stability of the cushion mechanism on how heavy you're striking through the heel mm -hmm. is if there's a perturbation or kind of a, a little bit of eversion that's occurring and whipping through the heel. And if, if there's any kind of spur activity or any kind of muscular tennis junction issue, then it could be just enough with a couple thousand reps that it kind of, it bothers you. Um, yeah. So 
I, you know, I typically, I kind of like those shoes, like you'd said for these type of folks, I typically keep those out of like the, the ultra world, the zero drop. Um, I'm not against those. Those are great for other, for other uh, issues, but it's something to kind of kind of think about and then the surface that you're walking on will make a difference too if it's unstable versus treadmill versus trail versus pavement um, there's a question from uh, Lynn, uh, Lindy I'm a plus size female runner at age 50 mostly half marathons these days which is awesome that's not yeah, awesome. Be over 50 doing half marathons is awesome in my book um, she's been running for 19 years I haven't had a running injury in 10 plus years um, I have been experiencing Achilles tightness after long runs, mostly half marathons, but even a 12 mile train run will give me tightness the next day. I'm thrilled to be injury free for 10 plus years, but I'm here because I want to remain injury free and address it before it becomes something I need to see a doctor for. What can I do to keep running and address the tightness before it becomes acute? Mm. Uh, short answer is probably needs a full assessment by myself or a physical therapist to kind of understand what's going on. Um, number one, congrats on being extremely, you know, active and very functional. And I think, you know, when we work with patients who are super active and very functional, those are the toughest people to make better, right? Um, and I think it would depend on what kind of shoe wear you're using, what kind of cross training you're doing, um, how you're working your way up to the events. It sounds like you're very experienced. I wouldn't imagine you would have right away switch to like a zero drop shoe or something which can totally cause these problems. Um, but I think it kind of goes back to the basics of what we've been talking about this talk, which is you need to do some eccentric strengthening, you need to do cross training, you need to be thoughtful about the shoe wear you're using. Um, and I'd probably start from there. But honestly, a little hard to answer that question without knowing a little bit more, I think. Yeah, and some other things I might think about too, which I'm, if they're this experienced, I'm sure they have 20 year runner is, you know, hydration is going to come into play, um, you know, sodium intake. So you can have some of those longer runs, especially with the weather when it's 80, 80, hopefully you're getting out early if you're running right now, but you know, the water loss will be high. Um, you know, I would kind of say, you know, getting some movement through the, through the calf and through the, the front of the ankle joint on a daily basis is going to be helpful as well. Yeah. Um, just to take stress and strain off of it. Uh, another another runner, um, I have pain while running and walking, but not swimming or biking. So I'm assuming that I can continue to do those activities during recovery. Generally, I would say yes. Um, I think you got to pay attention to to how you're feeling afterwards. But um, yeah, I, that I think doing low impact activity as part of your recovery protocol is very appropriate. Um, I think you do have to be kind of honest with yourself. You know, I've had patients who like, oh yeah, I'm, um, I'm not running, but I'm trying to keep, stay in shape for my, you know, Ironman and I'm on the bike for two and a half hours. And then the next day I still really hurt. And well, I mean, it doesn't hurt when you're on there, but you know, I think we're missing something. So I, I, I think you got to kind of be honest with whether or not it's causing pain for you afterwards, but in general, yes, low impact activities that don't hurt um, that are activating your calf muscle are okay with me. And I think, I think something that we haven't touched on yet, but it's something that I think hopefully most physical therapists will evaluate is when you do get a referral for kind of a chronic um, calf or, or mid substance kind of irritation is you, you definitely want to kind of screen the back and make sure this isn't an entrapment further up. I know I've had this myself where it felt like an Achilles issue. It actually was coming from kind of an L5 S1 issue, um, you know, just with some gentle, just hamstring work and some uh, some deadlifting and stuff. I was able to kind of get rid of the calf pain through that. Mm -hmm. so, so that's something to kind of be kind of kind of cleared out there too. Yeah, um, we have one individual who uh, Dr. Robert in Redmond, who I know well. She did his uh, shockwave and had a great recovery, but then re reoccurred when he tried to come back too fast, which we've all kind of done. Um, Dr. Bob Adams. Um, some evidence suggests in the research that NSAIDs might be detrimental in early stages of tendonitis. Um, kind, of a, kind of a comment there. I yeah, I, 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 I have, I have, I've seen that and totally agree. I think that's kind of why I keep saying, hey, they make you feel better, but they're not going to help you heal. Um, I don't know. I, Dr. Adams probably could tell us more about that than, than I could. But, um, but I, I, I think I, I early on when we're just trying to get them patients kind of walking again, I'm okay with it for a short burst, but yeah. I hear that and I've seen that 
I've seen that. Um, Marcelo, uh, what is the long-term outcome of surgery for tendinopathy? You kind of mentioned an answer, I think, on this a little bit. And then are patients able to eventually return to high impactivity, uh, i.e. trail running? Yeah, so I think in, in general, in those classic orthopedic studies, which are observational studies with small patient groups, so they're not, they're not great studies, but they say they report good to excellent outcomes with patient satisfaction um, uh, and return to function. So these are, these are not great studies, but yes, they are implying, and what I have seen is patients are able to return to their um, pre kind of injury level of activity, at least to a certain degree and with definitely less pain on a pretty consistent basis. Um, this is from one of our therapists, Mandy uh, Majerus writes, what helps you determine a plantar plate tear without imaging? What's your preferred early management of that? Plantar plate tear. And are we talking about, well, maybe, uh, well, um, plantar plate to me implies an injury at the base of the toes. Um, I usually will get an MRI to determine that, but oftentimes you can see that when, um, that, that can be an overuse injury from running where you'll see malalignment of the toes over time. Um, and if it's not responsive to some basic toe taping or uh, wearing a boot and splint, then I'll usually um, get an MRI to kind of see if there's anything that we can be doing uh, versus if it's very chronic, we just do kind of a standard hammer toe repair. I, I, I don't know if I'm missing missing the missing the question a little bit there, but. No, I think you, I think you got it. Um, Sharon writes, does red light therapy help insertional tendinosis? Um, I, I don't know any strong data. I think this kind of goes back to Ben's um, idea that you try it and it feels like it's working for you to do it. I think it's low risk, um, but I have not read data about that. What about you, Ben? I have not uh, read anything other than from companies that make red light therapy and cold yeah. laser. Yeah, I've seen ads for it. I've seen ads for it, yeah. Um, some of the best cold laser and red light therapy research is done by the companies themselves. Yeah, so, um, yeah I think it goes back to like, if it, if it feels like it's working then and you can do more than it's, it's working on some level. Yeah, I think it's low risk. Mm -hmm. Very low risk. Yeah. Uh, Mark, as a master's runner, which we spoke of a little bit earlier, are there specific exercises, stretches to try to avoid problems with the Achilles tendon? Mm. Uh, uh, I think again, you'll run into some different, this is probably a better physical therapy question to, to be honest with you. I think my short take is aggressive stretching early on when you're having a lot of pain can make things worse. And, um, I'll kind of defer to Ben here on the answer to that question. Yeah. I think like if I'm for, to be honest, I have a, I have a, um, like a night splint that I have it in our hall closet. And if I start feeling plantar fascial tightness or Achilles tightness, I'll just put that on while we're watching Netflix or while I'm doing laptop work in bed and just give it 45 minutes to an hour of a, a light um, load there for, for strengthening myself, even as a, you know, knock on wood, just, just like, like you, I've tried as a non Achilles patient this moment, I try to do eccentric work two times a week. And then I trail run about three or four days a week. Um, and that seems to keep things. I'm totally jinxing myself right now. So it keeps me you out are. of trouble. You're definitely <laughs> jinxing yourself. Yeah. I'll see you next week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Carl writes, I damaged my Achilles on a one mile walk using the new Hoka Bondi SRs. Been going to PT for about two months, which is helping. I might be, try a different Hoka now that I'm pretty much healed. Very informative. Thanks for the great presentation. So um, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but you might you might also try the Nimbus 25 or the uh, in October, the Brooks Ghost Max. Those are two comparable shoes that will kind of provide some interesting, uh, similar, but maybe a little different sensation. Mm -hmm. um, I got a few more for you. This is the most questions we've ever had. Are you, are you, <laughs> do, you need, do you need some water? Are you good? No, I'm good, man. I'm good. Okay, um, okay we kind of answered when the PT should refer to the practice. Um, this is maybe for the PTs out there. What's the best way to send a client over to you? I.e., uh, email, call, text, fax. What, yeah, what I mean, best? I mean, any any physical therapist that reaches out to me, I, they can have my cell phone number or or, um, or email, whichever they prefer, whichever is easier. And then we just got to be careful about obviously our patient protected information and how we send things to get patients in and see us. Um, but 
I'm happy to give out direct contact info to any of the physical therapists on this talk so they can kind of get people in to see me. I would like to do it for all the patients, but I can't do that right now because <laughs> I've got to get home eventually. And I can't answer all those questions, but um, we also could give out a clinic phone number for any time to get into um, just maybe at the end, maybe, at, you know, you can send out at the end of the talk just for the easiest way. But for the therapist, certainly I'm happy to send out personal contact info so that we can talk about patients and get them in sooner if needed. People can reach out to me for, for that, the PTs out there. Um, do you have a, do you have a, I can give you my take too, but do you have a recommendation for running mileage after an Achilles tendon injury, which is kind of a, to per this talk, that's kind of a very generalized, let's maybe say Achilles um, tendinosis. So where, where you're, yeah. you're finishing rehab or you're near finish rehab, is there a recommendation you have for mileage there? Um. I think it again kind of goes back to pre-injury level of activity and probably should be probably should be based a little bit on kind of percentages of what you were doing before. Um, however, I've learned through personal experience that you really do need to have kind of a cautious approach to return back so that you're not doing exactly what I'm doing right now where you're getting better and you're trying to get back into running and then you're injuring yourself again. So, I don't have that. I would probably defer to you um, or defer to a running coach or to, you know, whoever, whatever physical therapist you work with to do a running program. If you ask me to do it specifically for you, I'm going to be pretty conservative. I'm going to be pretty conservative. Yeah, I think that, that roller coaster you're talking about is a little bit like dieting. It's super psychologically frustrating if you've had a good rehab and then you get back too quickly. I would say for myself with my patients, um, I use pain and exertion is a good guideline. I typically, um, and my runners will hate me sometimes because it's, I like the 3% rule. I like to try to let the body have a chance to kind of remodel and be ready for the next level. So we'll do 3% increase over the course of a week if symptoms are, are down uh, and cadence is good. So I'm a big fan of cadence. So I like my runners, generally speaking, not all, but generally speaking between about 175 and 185. And if people aren't familiar with that, that's your steps per minute. And so there's good research from Rich Willie at the Montana Running Lab that talks about this too. And from Achilles specifically is when the, when the cadence drops um, 5% or 10%, the, the amount of wear and tear on the Achilles tendon is greater because your stride length is then longer. So you're kind of quote unquote overstriding or lingering in the uh, push off phase. Um, if you have a tighter cadence, there's gonna be less Achilles activity. Um, Again, more forefoot activity will increase the soleus um, gastroc complex, but it won't be putting it through an end range type motion. So, um, so I think if people can maintain, and I would consider that kind of good form, then we can kind of increase mileage. If your mileage is starting to get kind of sloppy and um, provoking some discomfort, then whether it be during or the next morning, it's not just normal muscle soreness, then that would be kind of a little bit of a concern for me. Yeah. Are you coaching people, you know, you kind of talked, you sort of touched on forefoot striking. Are you coaching people to change how they're running when you're uh, trying to treat Achilles tendinosis? Not, not typically, um, unless they come to me and want to change that, or, you know, they've been forefoot striking or heel striking. I have no preference really, other than I want them to strike softly. Um, and I want the cadence up high. So you can be a heel striker and still have a high cadence, you know, and, and still strike under the center of mass. Um, so I don't coach them out of that, but if they're, you know, kind of the you know, definition of insanity, if they've had like four injuries in a row and it's not yeah. a, you know, it's not a bone stress injury, we're talking just, it's just, you know, it's not a volume issue. It's more of just there. We think it might be actually like a gate mechanics issue. Then I think if they're open to that changing, which is a process, then it's something we can kind of discuss. And, um, you know, sometimes those can be kind of long, a long process too. Um, Dr. Sam Jorson and Ben, what are your favorite shoes? We kind of talked about this for avoiding Achilles issues with age zero drop or with an offset. I think, I think I'll let you take that one. You, we kind of talked about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. I, I think both Ben and I talked about this before, um, uh, we got online as well, where I think in general, we think zero drop is probably not the best thing as you are recovering from an Achilles tendon problem. That doesn't mean that you can't go back to it after you recover from your Achilles tendon problem, if that's if you feel good about that. But a zero drop means that you don't have any lift in the back of your heel. And that means that your Achilles is going through more of a range of motion 
um, it's just going it, to, it's, it's more likely to irritate it, I think, than uh, shoot with offset or um, a heel lift, a simpler way to say it, maybe. Right. Agreed. Agreed. And I, I do like like the zero drop shoe when it comes to like patellofemoral issues. If that yeah. looks appropriate, it takes a little pressure off the patellar tendon. Mm -hmm. um, studies are kind of in conflict, but most gait studies are not super easy to kind of replicate for every individual. It's more of N of one, which is I like to, I like to say. Um, uh, in terms of orthotics, do you guys prefer a softer orthotic or a more rigid in relation to pronatory movements? Yeah, I mean, we very briefly touched on why it makes sense that a flat foot shape can make Achilles tendon problems worse. It's kind of hard to describe without a model, which I really should have brought to me, but essentially in a, in a flat foot shape, your foot um, is pronated out, which is maybe a bad way to describe three different kind of uh, deformities that are occurring in the foot. Um, that's sort of the common way that it's described. And when your foot is in a flat foot shape, the foot is not very rigid. Um, and that puts a little more strain on your Achilles as you're trying to push off. So if you utilize an orthotic that um, inverts your foot or brings your talus over your calcaneus, you now have a rigid lever arm to push off of. And theoretically, that should give your Achilles an advantage. Um, so using a medial hind foot post orthotic or simply an arch support orthotic um, in the context of running uh, can be theoretically helpful. Um, they do tend to move around in your shoe. There's some conflicting data about whether or not they actually control pronation or not. But if I were gonna pick one, I'd pick an accommodative or softer orthotic that fit throughout the whole length of your shoe. And I would start certainly with an over-the-counter orthotic that's much cheaper and more accessible at like fifty to sixty dollars than a custom orthotic. I think that's the way I would start. Yeah, and we don't we didn't talk about this ahead of time, but you know, I do, I do do orthotics, and um, I like the accommodative or what uh, the lab we use is a proaerobic, which is a soft orthotic. There's a lot of debate out there between podiatry and PT and orthotists and prosthetists on like how much of the arch to capture and how much to put pressure on. I'm I'm in agreement. I like the economical, I come from a family of school teachers. So I like the economical version of starting with like a super feed or something of that nature. Yeah. And then over time, we can modify that up to a point where then, okay, now if we're having to modify a bunch of super feet and it's still not quite custom and they're having great, you know, great reduction of symptoms with that, then let's, we could look into a custom orthotic. And um, that's something we like, we like to do. We're, we're kind of proud that we have the cheapest orthotics in the state of Washington that are custom by yeah. design. Um, but not the cheapest lab. So we we try to make it something as accessible as we can. So they're still kind of expensive, but there are some there are some factors there. I like too if you're someone who's had if you have kind of a heel spur either on the back, like we talked about earlier, on the bottom for plantar fascia. I like to have a little bit of a carve out there. We have like a little bit of um, some relief and put in like a soft pour on material. It allows you to get a little deeper in the orthotic, get a little bit more of that stability we talked about. But the, nice. the most recent research that that I've seen from Data Shari at OSU Cascades, who does a lot of gate work for the military historically and also for running around the world, you know, it's it's really not preventing any pronation. There's a lot of argument out there like, oh, it stops all pronation. It really it would take quite a quite a rigid poly 6.0 to stop pronation. It's really acting as more of a proprioceptive device. And to our earlier discussion, if you are more of a four foot striker. In essence, this orthotic is not going to do too much from the standpoint of when you're running. It's going to be when you don't, when you are fatigued. And so when you're starting to get a little bit tired and the pronation moment is longer, the stance phase is longer, all of a sudden you think you had a four foot strike, but now you're heel striking. That's when it can come into play. So it could be kind of a safety on the back end. For, so for myself, like I've got a soft orthotic in my shoe. I'm a four foot striker. So my pronatory moment is not very long. I have a high cadence of about 175 and 180. But when I get fatigued or if it's a day like today and I have to run midday, which I don't recommend, but if you're running midday and you're fatigued and the, if there's humidity, we're back in Minnesota, the humidity, and then you kind of, your, your cadence goes down quickly. Um, if you're reading your Garmin or your Apple watch and you're kind of like, okay, this now my pronation is higher and I can feel my orthotic getting more active um, in the process. So, um, so it can, it can, it's something worth like meeting with a PT or um, uh, yourself or someone who specializes in this and then doing some, you know, some shotted with shoes on and some unshotted, some, some barefoot treadmill work and seeing what 
is actually going on there. Um, okay, last one that we haven't touched on. This is kind of controversial as well um, for, for yourself. Non-surgical Achilles research, um, you know, kind of what's being adopted, what's being talked about with your colleagues as far as not repairing an Achilles tendon that's torn. Mm -hmm. So for an acute rupture, we're talking about acute this is rupture. this is this is actually a long discussion. This is actually interestingly, it's, it's such a webinar. <laughs> yeah, it's such an easy diagnosis, um, and conversations with patients could be very very short. I could say your Achilles is torn. We're going to fix it. It's going to be fine because that's true. Um, but I think, you know, over the last 30 years, really, we are increasingly seeing that most patients do not need to have their Achilles tendon repaired. So I always have a long discussion about people talking about the pros and cons. I think the short summary is, is that if you compare non-operative treatment that is appropriate non-operative treatment, which means you get into a plantar flex immobilized position relatively early and you mostly stay there early on. And then you start early weight bearing and gentle uh, passive dorsiflexion range of motion. Those non-operatively treated patients tend to do very similarly to the operatively treated patients. I think the data has some suggestion um, in some papers, and again, this is controversial, of a lower re-rupture re rate in surgical care. Um, there are some papers that suggest more strength with surgical care than non-surgical care, but don't you can't quote me on that necessarily because it's not strong. Um, and certainly you can find a paper that says that that's not true, um, for sure. I think Surgery is indicated for patients that didn't do appropriate non-operative care, um, maybe can't be, can't trust themselves to do appropriate non-operative care, um, uh, and certainly should be done in patients who are low-risk surgical candidates. But in my practice, young, healthy people seem to choose it a little bit more than 50%, and older people, I probably push where does that cut off? I'm not going to say, but the where the I probably push towards non-operative care. So I, I think the data supports non-operative care as long as it's done appropriately. And I think that you should have that discussion with your surgeon um, for sure and kind of go over the, the risks and benefits. Because if you have surgery, you have risks like wound problems, infection, deep infection of your Achilles, which can be disastrous and knock on wood, I haven't had one yet. Um, uh, or nerve injury. And if you just do non operative care, none of those things can happen. Yeah. And I think that's something actually that's kind of, kind of jogging my, my mind here too, is that, you know, when it comes to having a physician involved, there is nothing wrong with having a second opinion too. So, I mean, I think you're yeah. a great, you're a great second opinion. Um, if people are having questions on, you know, the course of treatment, um, I'm not saying you need a doctor shop. I'm just saying like, if, if you're not sure, you know, like, your gut instinct is usually right on these. Like if you have a good feeling when you're with the physician, then that's usually a, a good choice too. Um, all right. So we got, um, I think through the majority of those, we had <laughs> about 25 questions. So that's the, that you, you now hold the record. Tell young Lee that you have the most. Thank questions. you. Thank um, you for your help with all the questions. I needed it. You've got the crown now. So, yeah. uh, so first of all, thanks for, for yourself for giving up your night. Appreciate it. And all the prep work. So I know it's, it, it looks like it's just an hour, but it's, you know, the prep and the, and the PowerPoint and uh, having to deal with all my emails back and forth with you. Um, and uh, I want to let everybody know if you have friends or colleagues that you think would want to watch this, we're going to, we'll have this uploaded to our YouTube channel. Probably, I mean, probably tomorrow morning, to be honest. Um, so we'll have that kind of edited out and then we'll have some clips available um, that we'll kind of push out over the next couple of months of like little, just really poignant, amazing pearls that uh, that, that Adam uh, from from both of us. Those. From both yes. of us, yes. Yeah. Well, those will go out on our Instagram, um, so you can follow us there. Is there anything that we should uh, follow with yourself? Is, are, no, I'm not a big social media guy. Although maybe you'll motivate me to get, to get on there. But but thank you very much for having me. It was fun to be here. I learned some stuff. Hopefully, everybody watching did too. Great, and we'll have like we talk, any, any of the references we. We have, I'll add those to the notes on the YouTube page too. So people can kind of, if you want to dig into some research or dig into different shoe types, I'll try to put it all in there. So give me, give me a little bit of time. We'll take to compile all that and we'll get that going. But um, I can't thank you enough. It's great. It's great seeing you the other day in person and 
it's great having you take some time tonight. So I appreciate it. And it's great to have you as part of the community. You're doing a great job. So thanks, thanks so much. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye, guys.